I'm in the Karakoram Desert in Turkmenistan tonight and we're camping and gonna have a barbecue. You should check out our Weber. And welcome to what any Zoroastrian would call heaven, but what everybody else calls the gates of hell. The gates of hell was created accidentally about 60 years ago when some gas explorers accidentally set this thing alight, discovering, well, gas. Rumour has it that the current president wants to put this out, so you continue gas exploration. But I got two pieces of news for him. One, I know there's gas here. And two, I reckon it's a pretty cool tourist attraction. I've seen a lot of things in life, and this is one of the most surreal. I bet most of you have never heard of it, but over my left shoulder looks like some pretty solid sand dunes, but in fact they're not, they're walls. From a civilization which at its height, some people say had 1.5 million people around the turn of the millennium, around the year 1000. Truth is it was probably closer to around about 300,000, given exaggeration of old historians, but nevertheless, when you consider how many people were on the face of the earth, to come to a city of 300,000 over a thousand years ago would have seemed incredibly daunting. Oh, if only these walls could speak. They would talk of great travellers and traders and names that have echoed down history, including Alexander the Great and Amir Tamur, otherwise known as Tamerlane. They've overseen some of the great events, these walls, and they would talk of the Great Silk Road because these walls, these walls are an ancient nerve in modern day Turkmenistan, which was at its height, one of the largest and most powerful cities in the world. I'm standing what looks like an old sand dune, but in fact, it's the citadel of old Merv. Merv was built out of mud bricks, often unbaked. And you can pick them up as you walk through here. When you walk down here, it's very soft underfoot because it is fine powdered sand, which for a thousand years under many feet had been mashed with straw to turn into bricks to build these great walls, the citadel, and all the other magnificent parts of what ancient Merv must have looked like. I'm now standing in the gap of the great round wall that surrounded the main part of Merv and the Citadel. And if you let your imagination go back two and a half thousand years to when that son of Philip of Macedon on his white horse, Alexander, came in here conquering and ruling, claiming as part of his great empire. And you can get caught up in the romance of that whole nearly two and a half thousand years of history. But if you go back only a thousand years or a tad less to when Chinggis Khan's son came in here to wreak revenge for the murder of the embassy that Chinggis had sent, requesting Merv to succumb to his rule. And in response, Chinggis Khan's son butchered the entire inhabitants so even though Chinggis Khan and his lot destroyed Merv, let's talk about Mongolian invaders for a moment. In Ulaanbaatar, the capital of modern day Mongolia, they worship Chinggis Khan. His statue is everywhere. But in places like Central Asia, Chinggis Khan is remembered as a brutal invader. And honestly, he really could be. But if you succumbed and didn't fight Chinggis Khan, there was an interesting side. Some historians say Chinggis Khan had a 10-point Bill of Rights, which was one of the first Bills of Rights in the world, in which, amongst other things, he guaranteed freedom of religion, equality before the law, and equality of the genders. So if you succumbed, you could actually have a pretty benign life under the Mongolian rule. 
But if you didn't succumb and you allowed them to invade, they would butcher you brutally. And wandering around, you get caught up in the romance of that. You can find shards of old wine or beer or water jars that can remind you of the happy life. But in the bones, the fibulas and the vertebrae of the humans that were butchered here. And imagine what these walls were like echoing the screams and the cries as the flames burnt and the swords crashed down upon innocent people. And how much happiness and how much absolute sadness these bricks saw for the 1500 years that this city dominated and the thousand years nearly that since then it's allowed the wind and the rain to turn these bricks and these fine buildings in this great history into a powdery dust that slips through your fingers. One of the great things about touristing a little bit off the beaten track is you tend to have a place all to yourself. I mean, here was a central part of human history. And look how many other tourists are here. Morning and welcome to the desert of Turkmenistan, the Karakorom Desert. And you can imagine in the days of the Silk Road that people had to pass through this territory, feeling the dust in their lungs and the sun on their faces, the heat of the day and the cold of the morning like now. And how much they would like relief from this sort of weather. We've stopped just outside Ashgabat to get our car clean because there's a rule here. Only clean cars are allowed inside the city. We should maybe think about that. Welcome to the gleaming new capital of Ashgabat in Turkmenistan. I say gleaming new, but it was initially a trading oasis holding on to the edge of the Karakorom Desert until the Russians decided to make it the main trading post between Persia and Russia, I don't know, about uh, 150 odd years ago. It then grew as a city, became the capital of the Turkmen Socialist Soviet Republic in Soviet days, and following the collapse of the Soviet Union became the capital of modern day Turkmenistan. In the intervening period in 1948, one of the largest earthquakes ever known hit here around about 9 magnitude on the Richter scale, about the same as the tsunami or the Fukushima earthquakes, and it completely flattened the city. After independence, they decided to completely rebuild the place and get rid of a lot of the old Soviet architecture, building it almost completely out of white marble. Well, the Guinness Book of World Records claims this to be the best white marble city in the world. I'm struggling to think of the second. The Lonely Planet describes this architecturally as halfway between Pyongyang and Las Vegas. Having been both to Pyongyang in North Korea and Las Vegas, I don't think it's anything like the two of them. But there is some of this amazing new architecture around. I think it's more like Dubai. It is perched on the edge of the desert. You come from the dry hills down into the green oasis and surrounded by this beautiful marble. Like a lot of Central Asian new cities, it is bristlingly clean. You could almost eat off the streets. The cleanliness is taken to another level when you realise what I'm walking through right now is not a hospital ward, but a street underpass. The building of Ashgabat has been funded from the oil and gas money that this country has. About 80% of this country is desert. There's a, a cotton crop in the north on the border with Uzbekistan, draining water from the RLC, thanks to Joseph Stalin. Cotton fields like this was one of uh, Stalin's great ideas. Of let's use the water resources to create a cotton crop, which means countries like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan have huge cotton crops and huge fields, and they use a lot of water, which is why the RLC is shrinking and why we see a lot of salinity in the soil. But the main economy, economic driver is oil and gas, and it is the fossil fuel industry that is driving this economy. 
you do see in the capital here in Ashgabat a lot of money being spent and a lot of infrastructure being built. Like a lot of the other Central Asian states though, when you move outside of the capital, you can see economic development hasn't fully reached the rest of the country. Hasn't fully reached is a nice way of saying a lot of villages have, uh, still live in a way probably largely unchanged from the Soviet days. But that having been said, when you come off the hills, come out of the Karakoram Desert, and you hit this white marble oasis, it feels kind of surreal. I thought I'd come to the camel market today. See if I can buy a camel. I have just had one of the more unusual tourism experiences that I've had, where the guy took us to dinner to a food court in a shopping center. Now, to be fair, it was interesting to see that uh, Ashgabat isn't at all the mini Pyongyang that some people claim it to be. It's more like a mini Dubai with the same sort of things in the shopping centres and the same sort of food courts. Like Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan has largely been led by one man, Turkmenbashi, he called himself, the leader of the Turkmans who died about eight or nine years ago, and his successor, his then deputy, has been leading ever since, winning an astonishing 98% in elections. I have a great deal of faith in those results. So many of the international observers do question Turkmenistan's human rights record, its uh, democratic record, its liberal record but it is delivering some degree of economic growth into a country which was a Soviet backwater at best. An unusual aspect of Turkmenbashi's leadership is the spending of $300 million of government money on the construction of a mosque and mausoleum complex to house his mother, father, two brothers and himself. Whilst you might have sympathy for the fact that his brothers and mother died in the 1948 earthquake and his father died in World War II, it is this type of dictatorial spending without accountability that makes you concerned for the future of a country. The religion of Turkmenistan is, is about 80% moderate Islamic. When I say moderate, I say coming out of that forced secularism that existed in the Soviet Union days. But like its neighbour next door in Uzbekistan, it is challenged by radical Islam. Less than two dozen mosques here in 1991, about a thousand today. Bordering both Iran and Afghanistan, Iran is searching for influence here in Turkmenistan, and the Fagana Valley which Uzbekistan and Afghanistan share, you see a growing militancy existing and forcing a new version of Islam on some of the occupants. The Uzbekistan Islamic Front has largely been concentrating on fighting in Afghanistan the last couple of decades. And the question now comes whether that growth will move into southern Uzbekistan and eastern uh, Turkmenistan to give the authorities another problem to deal with, growing radicalization of Islam. I'm still trying to figure Turkmenistan out. On the surface, it's very easy to say this is a mid-level economy growing on the back of an oil and gas industry. And it's easy to say there's a former Soviet Republic that hasn't made a full Western style transition to democracy. However, when you look more deeply and start to ask this question, when did the Turkmens have a Western-style democracy? Certainly not the Soviet Union, not in Tsarist Russia, not in small Khanates, not under Tamerlane, not under Alexander the Great, and not under any of the Arabic traders. So culturally, this is not a country that demands that sort of thing. And while people on the street will tell me, oh yes, they don't have Facebook, and no, they don't have Twitter, they recognize those sorts of freedoms are not theirs to have, but they don't reach out and cry for them either. While there is an economic payback and provincial towns can have hotels like this, people see that their country is moving forward and experimenting with independence in a way that they want to. Yes, there are human rights abuses, yes, there's political repression, but on the streets there's not a feeling of danger, there's not a feeling of being in a repressive society like it did when I was in North Korea.
Indeed, when I walk through the markets and you can happily engage and talk with anyone, we, as tourists, are a passing curiosity as best. We're not actually that interesting to them. So it's a funny country. It is evolving in a way that wouldn't be comfortable for the West, but that's not to say it's wrong. It's a country that is getting economic growth, which is good. It's a country which still has a number of challenges around freedoms and around human rights and around terrorism. But in the end, it's a country I've enjoyed, I've liked. It's got some great history and I recommend you come too.